The man the Conservatives were counting on to turn the economy into a vote winner hikes interest rates. Want to bet on the feel-good factor? Good evening. The first rise in interest rates for over 20 months sends a variety of messages. Supporters say it establishes the Chancellor's bona fides as someone prepared to risk electoral goodwill in pursuit of his economic goals. But does it? Or is it too little to be meaningful and yet enough to send the wrong message to much of business? We'll talk it through with a business person, an economist and a supporter of the Chancellor. The mother of six-year-old Ricky Neve is cleared of his murder but jailed after admitting cruelty to her children. I'll be asking the director of Cambridgeshire Social Services why warning signs about the family appear not to have been acted upon. She's a lone mother of five on the dole in New York. Now she has to work for her money under a new privatised workfare scheme. Steve Evans will be asking does workfare do more damage than good to the unskilled labour market. I'll be reporting from the future from New York City where controversial new ideas for dealing with the unemployed are up and running and heading towards Britain. I'll... At 19 stone he's the weightiest leader in Europe and tomorrow he becomes the longest serving German Chancellor since the war. What makes Helmut Kohl tick and could he outlast Bismarck in power? We'll be discussing his style and his considerable substance. A quarter of 1% doesn't sound much, it isn't much. Mortgage lenders didn't take the chance to sting borrowers by passing it on. But the significance of today's rise in interest rates is that it follows the best part of two years when they've been falling. And that it's been thought necessary to forestall inflation getting above the designated target. So far, so much economic sense. But the politics are something else. The government had been counting on that irritating cliché, the feel-good factor, to make the electorate better disposed towards them than their current miserable poll performance suggests. Graham Ingham now returns to report on what has prompted Kenneth Clark to raise the rates. It might only be a quarter of one percent, but for retailers in the Whitgift shopping centre in Croydon, today's move was bad news. Geraldine Roche-Boué, proprietor of Le Saint-Jacques, a French restaurant in the Whitgift centre, is worried by the prospect of a fall off in business. We're a very small business, um, we're, we're a luxury item, people don't have to come out and buy a three course French meal, they can buy the, in the supermarket and cook at home. We were beginning to recover and that recovery has been very fragile, so I wouldn't like to see it shattered by this increase uh, in interest rates. No Chancellor wants to rock the boat with only months to go before the election. Kenneth Clark has always prided himself on steering the economy with a steady hand and on giving the Governor of the Bank of England, Eddie George, plenty of chance to have his say. Steady Eddie and Canny Ken is how the Chancellor refers to their relationship. But while Mr Clark listens to the Governor's advice, he doesn't always heed it and until now has been resisting pressure to raise interest rates. So Mr George had a pleasant surprise this morning when he went to the Treasury for his monthly meeting with the Chancellor. The Chancellor has repeatedly insisted that he's prepared to take whatever action necessary to keep inflation under control. But there's been growing scepticism about Mr Clark's willingness to take politically unpopular decisions ahead of the election. His differences with the Governor are well known. But Newsnight has learned that the Chancellor has also overridden the advice of his own officials at the Treasury on at least one occasion over the past few months. So why has he changed his mind now, just when he was least expected to do so? Recent pointers to possible inflationary pressures in the economy include GDP, a measure of what the economy produces in total, which grew by 0.8% in the three months to September and was 2.3% higher than a year ago, Unemployment, which fell last month to its lowest level for five and a half years, to just over two million. And average earnings, now rising by 4% a year, the fastest rate for more than two years, and well above the rate of inflation. Given this, is today's rise enough? I don't think that that is enough, no. Uh, I think that uh, we need a, a further increase, perhaps of half percent or even one percent from here. Uh, the economy is growing quite strongly at present, it's not booming. But the danger is that uh, unless interest rates are raised again, um, in early 97 it could be booming. 
and that would, be, that would raise inflation worries for 98 and 99. While some people thought the Chancellor might just get away without any rises before the election, Mr Clark seems to have decided that he had to come down hard on the inflationary pressures building up, and that it was worth, after all, taking the Governor's advice to move now by a small amount, rather than later, when a larger, even more unwelcome rise might be forced on him. Of course, Mr Clark will also have one eye on Tory backbenchers who are still hoping for tax cuts in next month's budget, which today's move may make more likely. This certainly improves the Chancellor's opportunity for uh, building in a budget of tax reductions, uh, not excessive tax reductions, but reasonable tax reductions, and he can go on to build on that budget uh, through next year with an ever-improving economy. This decision is very valuable from that point of view. That's Mr Clark's gamble. Can he deliver plausible tax cuts which will compensate those upset by what they see as a setback today? Or for those already worried about their economic future, is there more pain to come this side of the election? Well, we're joined now by uh, an economist, a business person and a political ally of the Chancellor. Um, John Shepherd, first of all, had a big psychological impact this uh, hike today. Is it the end of rises in interest rates? I think certainly not. I think he's signalled that the cycle has turned and I think he's signalled that he is concerned about excessive growth next year putting up inflation as your news report indicates. But 1% isn't going to do the job. 1% will not slow the economy to a degree that is required. To well, achieve he's only put up a target. quarter of 1%, so he's going he's to have to put quarter it up. percent, sorry, it's not enough. It, it's got to be um, something closer to 7% uh, base rates, I think, by the end of next year. Do you saying it's going to go up another 1.5 percentage points before? Another 1%, I think, another from these one... levels by the end of next year. Um, do you think he, politically he'd be able to get away with that? Um, it may not be totally his political decision, of course, given that some of those increases may come after the election. But if it were to be his decision, I think yes. I think it's the price of success to a degree. And I think we've got to put this in context. The lowest level of, uh, of base rates we saw in the 1980s was 7.5%. We're talking about possibly a peak of interest rates of 7% in this cycle. It looks a lot better than it did at any stage in the last 20 years. Well, Georgina James, in that context, it could get a great deal worse. This tiny little rise today is really surely not something to be terribly bothered about. Well, one view is that it's quite prudent if you're going to move rates at all to just move them by a quarter of, of 1% because we all know interest rates are a blunt instrument and that way you're mm. perhaps not going to do too much harm if you get it wrong. On the other hand, what really matters, I think, is real interest rates. You can't look at interest rates on their own. If interest rates do go up to 7% and inflation hits 25 you're going to be looking at 4.5% in real terms, the interest rates, because obviously you have to deduct the inflation from it. That would be a very high rate of real interest. It could damage a lot of small businesses quite severely, I would think. Uh, you're saying could, could, could. Um, you're not saying will, will, will. Well, I do hope they don't go up to 7%. I don't actually believe that but the economy is, is going to go to boom, as was said earlier, in early 1997. I don't think anybody in business would right. want to see that anyway. It's not good for us. We wish for stability. Now, Sir Michael Gross uh, at Westminster, this is a precautionary me measure, we're told, in order that there are no risks taken with, uh, with inflation. Does it really matter if he misses the inflation target by a quarter of 1% or half of 1% or something? Well, I think uh, having achieved the lowest rate of inflation uh, for a generation, for 50 years, it's a huge achievement. And I know the Chancellor, and I certainly support him uh, in that, is determined to take no risks with that achievement. Because keeping inflation down is vital. We've heard about the small businesses, very important. But it's very important for them that inflation is kept low. That is their best security of a good future. So. Uh, he's being prudent here, he's taking action mm. well in advance. Output has increased, as you quite rightly said in your, pro in your earlier piece, and he's taking action to make sure that inflation does not go up in 18 months or two years' time. So you and would I think be it, show it shows, incidentally, that he's confident that uh, all will work, go well in the election, and he will still be Chancellor, and therefore he wants to take no risks with inflation. So uh, as somebody going round, uh, potentially start knocking on, on, on door knockers on, uh, with a view to May the 1st or whenever it is, yeah. you'd be quite happy if he had to put it up another 1%, uh, would you? Well, if it was necessary, in order to keep inflation down, I don't think anybody wants to change interest rates just for the fun of it. It's a bit like uh, driving a car, isn't it, really? You've got a balance between your 
your brake and your, your accelerator, and you've got to get the balance right so your car moves smoothly. John now, we've, got to make, we've got to make sure that the economy moves smoothly and doesn't accelerate into inflation. And that will mean that there probably will be a number of alterations over a period of time to interest rates. This one is precautionary, and I believe proves that he's a very prudent, very sensible chancellor acting well ahead of the time. Uh, John Shepard, just uh, talk us through this. Uh, interest rates go up. Sterling, therefore, becomes more attractive for those who deal in, 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 in currencies. Mm. Therefore, our exports become more expensive. Yes. Uh, this is a bad news, isn't it? Well, certainly it does squeeze exports, and the rise in sterling we've seen 4% over the past couple of months does put a lot of pressure on the productive side of the economy. The problem is that what's going on in the economy at the moment is a booming consumer sector. I think one of the crucial figures this week was that consumer credit is up 16% on the year. It's not so much exports which are driving the economy, it's the consumer, the traditional UK consumer boom. Exactly. And that's what has got to slow. But that is going to get a great deal worse if the pound becomes more valuable. Well, the consumer boom... exports are harder to sell. Exports are harder to sell. Um, but it doesn't affect the consumer directly. You can't rely on a stronger sterling to squeeze the economy and slow growth in that regard if you've got consumer spending next year increasing at a 3.5% pace. It's that 3.5% pace of consumer spending which will drive the economy by a similar amount. And that is, unfortunately, unacceptably fast. Would that it wasn't. It wasn't. It'd be lovely if we could run at 3, 3.5% growth. But that's not an option when the maximum feasible growth rate in the economy over the longer term is two, two and a half. And We've got to aim for that. That is the old problem of the limits to our natural growth. Absolutely. Uh, and if we could avoid those limits, the Chancellor's job would be very easy. Georgina James, uh, this is uh, about not, a uh, horrible old cliche, not taking any risks with inflation. Uh, when you worry about uh, interest rates and what that does to borrowing for business, do you not worry more about inflation? I don't think that, as I said before, you can take inflation and interest rates separately. You have to look at the two together. One thing that does worry me about the interest rates is that if they go up too far, as you've said, it does make mm. the pound era and, and, and exports more difficult, but it's also investment. Um, will be more difficult and uh, quite frankly our record recently in investment is not good and this won't help it. It's always a different, difficult balancing act but the idea of a consumer boom I think is, is a very strange one because as far as I can see out there things are better but good grief they couldn't have got a lot worse. Well, people are borrowing and a great deal more, we know that. Certainly so. They're certainly going for that, but I think it's they're planning their credit now. There's a lot more use of interest-free credit. There's a lot of volume in sale terms going through retailers, but that's not the same as profit margins. Isn't the problem with this is that what we've done over the years is, is give the economy the benefit of the doubt. We've seen pressures build up, we've seen strong growth, and we always say, well, don't worry about it, it won't lead to inflation. We said that back in 1988. And when we realise the problem is upon us, it's too late. Uh, and chancellors have fallen on that path time and time again. Here we've got a chancellor who's saying, let's look at the forecast, let's look at a two-year view of inflation, and he's being prudent, preemptive, and, and forward-looking. Okay. I think we should applaud that. We'll leave it there. Thank you both very much. I'll thank all three of you very much. Thank you. The bald facts of the short life and horrifying death of six-year-old Ricky Neve are distressing enough. What makes matters worse, if that's possible, is the fact that the boy's mother was acquitted of the murder but jailed for cruelty to Ricky and her two other children, and she had warned Cambridgeshire Social Services Department of what might happen. Two social workers have now been suspended while an inquiry tries to find out again what went wrong in another tragic case. The judge at Northampton Crown Court said he'd rarely come across a case of such persistent and systematic cruelty. Afterwards, Ricky's relatives were clearly angry at what they saw as the failure of social services to protect the child. The family are calling for a public inquiry into the negligence of Camishire County Council Social Services Department to investigate why the law, should have, which, should, which should have been there to protect Ricky, failed to do so. No other child should suffer the way Ricky did and his family hoped that the result of an inquiry would be a reinforcement of the laws that are supposed to be keeping children safe. The court had heard that Ruth Neve, a drug addict with a violent temper, was wholly unfit to be a mother. Before his death, she'd asked social services to take Ricky into care, but nothing happened. Neighbours on the estate where he lived saw the warning signs. I saw Ruth and there was another girl standing with her 
and they were hanging Ricky over the bridge. Just past the wooden beam just there. And he wasn't crying, but he was screaming, and them two were just laughing. The preliminary findings of an independent inquiry into the way Cambridgeshire Social Services handled Ricky Neve's case points to serious failings on the part of the social workers. It shows files went missing when the family moved house, that there was confusion over whether Ricky was at risk and child protection procedures weren't followed in his early years. Unison, which represents the social workers involved in Ricky Neve's case, are calling for a further independent investigation into what happened. First of all, the fact that from September 1992, Unison were raising concerns about staffing levels within the East Team in Peterborough. And not only staffing levels, but also the use of unqualified staff or staff with inappropriate experience to deal with child protection cases. Secondly, the fact that when staff raised these concerns, they weren't addressed by the department. They were either ignored or staff raising concerns were really branded as troublemakers. Ruth Neve's remaining children are now likely to be put up for adoption. Today, though, there remain 380 families on the at-risk register in Cambridgeshire. Well, we're joined now by uh, Ted Unsworth, who's the Director of Social Services in uh, Cambridgeshire. These two people have been suspended, Mr Unsworth. Uh, why have they been suspended? You'll appreciate I can't discuss that in great detail in case I prejudice the process we've been put in place to ensure that these matters are properly investigated. Uh, but we have sufficient concern to suspend them from work so we can pursue our inquiries. Are these the two people who were primarily involved in the case? Uh, they were involved at a key stage in the case. And you can't tell us any more than that? I'm afraid I can't at this stage in case I prejudice the inquiries we're making, but clearly we're treating this with grave concern. Um, how is it, Mr Unsworth, that files can be lost when somebody moves house? Uh, there were some files that went missing, uh, some historical files that didn't contain current information. But all files are historical in this context, uh, aren't no, they? The, the current case files that were relevant at the time of Ricky's tragic death uh, we're clearly in the possession of the right people. Some files that contain information uh, that were relevant two or three years before uh, did go missing for a period. Uh, we investigate that with the assistance of the police. Unfortunately, that, in that inquiry was inconclusive. So you never found out why the files had gone missing? We didn't. Um, am I right in thinking that the overwhelming priority um, in the minds of many of the social workers, in this and in other cases, uh, is that the family should, if possible, be kept together. This is always a question of balance, as you appreciate. Uh, we're required by law to do all we can to maintain families intact. Um, and that is the objective, that was the objective, in, in the case of those people working with Ricky Neve. What was clear throughout the trial uh, was that Mrs Neve was well able to convince those people who were trying to help her that she was capable of being a better mother than in fact she turned but she out to be. But she warned you that she might do serious damage to the children. There were a number of circum instances when she did make those sorts of uh, cries for help, if you like, and there were other times when she withdrew them, so the message was not at all consistent. And the people on the ground at the time made the judgment that uh, the arrangements they were putting in place were in the best interest of Ricky. Mr Unsworth, thank you very much. The first graduate, if that's the right word, of a pilot workfare scheme in Maidstone arrived, emerged today. Workfare is the arrangement popularised in America where unemployed people have to toil for their benefit instead of getting it automatically. It's said to break the dependency culture and get people into the habit of work. Not only is the government impressed enough to run pilot schemes, the Labour Party is also intrigued enough to be dropping hints about their interest. What we don't know, because until these pilot schemes we haven't had it in Britain, is whether workfare works. Stephen Evans compares the American experience with the schemes operating here. This is the future. The jobless in Hull are set to work redecorating a chapel. If they refuse, their benefits are cut. Next month, the government will spell out how the schemes to be extended across the country. The official verdict is bullish. Hull shows the way forward. Officials have toured the experimental schemes and pronounced them successful. We're getting unemployed people into jobs, and we're talking to people who've been unemployed for at least two years, many of them a lot longer than that. 
And for those who are not getting into jobs, we're then placing them onto the, the work experience element, which is giving them up-to-date work experience, which makes them more attractive to employers, because we know that one thing that employers value is recent experience of the work environment. We ought to end welfare as we know it. It ought to be a second chance, not a way of life. A populist American electoral message echoes across the Atlantic. And liberate their kids. Ladies and gentlemen, these schemes make sense and they're working. And this afternoon, I'm announcing their extension to include up to 100,000 unemployed people in every region of the country. And Labour's moving the same way talking quietly to American workfare proponents, considering schemes to have British unemployed people earning their dole. New York is the testing ground. British politicians in both big parties are studying schemes there. Again, the message is bullish. Workfare eases unemployment. In parks around the city, in offices, 23,000 people push brooms and pens or lose their welfare money. No choice. If you don't want to work for it, you'll be cut off. You know? So I just decided to either do it or don't do it. One or two. That's it. So I'd rather do it and, you know, get what little I get to live off of till I get better here and go out there and find something more. But as the British vogue increases, some Americans are now getting skeptical, discovering pitfalls. Suddenly the answers aren't so simple. Making the unemployed perform tasks may actually increase unemployment. As jobless leave schemes and compete for fully paid jobs, American academics say there's a jolt to the unskilled labor market. Workfare will not reduce unemployment. I think what workfare will do in part will to be to increase the number of people who are cycling through those jobs. Uh, so it will, there will be more people who have employment uh, over the course of a year, but the total employment, paradoxically, will not go up. There is the revolving door question about the schemes in this city currently being studied in Britain. The question of whether through subsidy people on welfare have the effect of displacing people in employment back out onto the dole. In New York, thousands of municipal jobs have gone, the work now done by the unemployed. Economists say it sent shockwaves across the labour market, depressing pay and spending power, particularly in poor areas. Yes. New York union bosses now feel See pressure from their members. More to think about than hoop dreams. You have tremendous tension, tremendous potential confrontation, because that worker who's working full time has the fear that that welfare recipient will replace them at a lower salary, okay? It's not gonna happen under the new law and under our contract that a worker will be replaced. But if a worker leaves tomorrow, they can fill that slot, that vacancy, with a welfare recipient. In the last three years in New York City, we've lost 17,000 jobs, 17,000 good high-wage jobs with benefits, with health insurance. Those jobs have disappeared from city government all in the name of downsizing or making government more efficient or whatever. They've been replaced by, at this moment, 35,000 people in this workfare scheme who are just working off a welfare check. And it really is a sub-minimum wage. People on welfare have stringent tests to make sure they're not cheating, double dipping as it's called, getting two payments by using false names. They have their pictures taken. They're fingerprinted for computer records to stop fraud. That plus workfare has cut welfare rolls. Okay. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too. But is the lower welfare bill just claimants being frightened off? Workfare instills a habit of work, promotes initiative. According to the man behind the scheme in City Hall, Despite The Economist's assertions, workfare doesn't push existing workers out. What these people out of workfare do is work in the parks or in cleaning streets or in cleaning city buildings or in serving meals to senior citizens that would not otherwise be done. But parks would have been cleaned otherwise. Parks would have been cleaned, but they wouldn't have been cleaned as well. That's why today 
we have a uh, cleanliness rating in the park system that's at a 22-year high. But a picture of workfare recipients replacing redundant workers is borne out by recent studies. Examining the first two years of the program with standard economic methods to predict future trends, it was shown that unskilled workers are paid on average $6.33 an hour, while someone on workfare costs just $4.33, less than the legal minimum wage for an employed person. The impact of the 30,000 current workfare placements is to lower wages across the public and private sector to $5.76, or if wages don't shift, to displace an estimated 20,000 existing jobs. To take 4 million men from the breadlines and give them jobs which will provide for their families, President Roosevelt has allotted $400 million. But for many in America, workfare today smacks of 30s leftish New Dealism. The state meddling with markets, no less than socialism to some. But private enterprise is now at hand. Teresa Jones is a single mother of five. She's been taken on, on welfare, by a private employment company, America Works. It makes a profit by hiring her to a clothing firm at a higher fee than welfare. This is better than welfare. Because if I get this permanent job, and they let welfare know that I have a permanent job, and I'm making more than welfare giving me, I would tell welfare, adios. Her hope is that it will become fully paid, a proper job. America Works says she has a better chance through this reintroduction to work. Whatever the short-term question about profits made by hiring out the unemployed on higher rates than the welfare they get. The company's heading for Britain, meeting Conservative and Labour politicians next month. Labour's now finalising its policy with workfare, privatised workfare, highly contentious. People have to think outside the box. Everybody is so set in the idea that there has to be a dole, that there has to be um, funds to keep people at home, and I think you're going to have to break that assumption. When you meet Labour politicians next week, what will you tell them? I'll tell them that they better get on and, and embrace the idea quickly because um, I think, you know, if, if they get excited about it and they can embrace it, that it will be a win for them. The American labor market isn't the British one, but there are enough similarities to make the export of ideas with adaptation feasible. The man in Britain liaising with labor and conservative ministers and shadow ministers is Roderick Nye. Both parties are clearly very concerned about the problem of long-term unemployment. They're also looking for ways to make work fair, work in this country. I think you'll find that the government is more sympathetic to a private sector solution, particularly one which places people in real jobs. Um, the Labour Party too may, may follow suit further down the line. Projects like Hull will expand tenfold across the country. The big question is whether expansion on that scale will mean the unemployed intruding on jobs that the fully paid ought to do. Workfare, though the parties don't like the word, has arrived. Whatever the actual evidence about whether it diminishes unemployment or simply shares it about differently, the momentum for making the unemployed work for their money will grow, whoever wins the general election. As the government presses on next month, Labour unveils what's expected to be greater commitment to making the unemployed work for their dole. Tricky politics because of union doubts. The lesson from across the Atlantic is that workfare offers no simple answers. What may be good for the currently unemployed has hard implications for the currently employed. Now, when Helmut Kohl wakes up tomorrow morning, he'll have achieved something remarkable. He'll become the longest-serving German Chancellor since the Second World War. 14 years and one month. Helmut Kohl is the colossus of European politics in every sense of the word. A legendary guzzler who's united his country on one currency and now drives the rest of Europe to a single currency. The way things look, he might even go on to beat the all-time record of Bismarck of 19 years. Well, we'll be discussing what makes him tick in a moment. The man who towers over Europe has never abandoned, never apparently wanted to abandon his provincial middle-class roots. He may have begun his leadership tentatively, but he's grown in confidence as the years have passed and was and is central to the remoulding of Europe. 
He is the last German leader to have been shaped by the war. His father fought on the Polish front and his brother never returned from the fighting. Like the rest of the country, his hometown was shattered by Allied bombing. But the young Cole was ambitious, as a friend at the time remembers. In the later school times, uh, he talked in a small circle of friends and, and other boys that he could imagine to become a high leader in political life. The best position, he added, smiling, uh, could be the position of the Chancellor of the Republic. We laughed at, at such sentences, but this should become the guideline of his political career. And he was ambitious for his country as well. During the years of the Wirtschaftwunder, the economic miracle that saw Germany transformed from ruins to riches, Kohl became a devotee of Chancellor Konrad Adenauer and committed to his grand vision of the country and the continent. Well, he calls himself the grandson of Konrad Adenauer and is always quoting Konrad Adenauer that the German reunification and the European unification are two sides of the same coin. This will be roasted off and then uh, roasted in the oven. But the appetite for big ideas is matched by an appetite for the ordinary. Cole's love of pig's belly and sauerkraut is legendary. His enthusiasm for all provincial cuisine has endeared him to an electorate who sent stability in a chancellor measuring six feet four and 19 stone. For many Germans, he is one of us, a man who prospered with them in the Fresswelle or wave of guzzling that was the consumer boom of the 60s and 70s. He is popular because he is a buddy buddy. He is actually uh, some a petit bourgeois himself, a provincial man himself, and he attracts this kind of uh, uh, friendship and uh, so from other people. And that uh, is his strength. Uh, you know, when he likes to uh, have a bath in the crowd, as you call it, and um, uh, first of all, he goes to the little man and shakes his hand. He also shared the other side of the German post-war story, partition when desperate East Germans sought ways through the wall that divided Berlin. When, in 1989, the wall was physically dismantled along with the communist regime that had built it, Kohl saw the chance to achieve his dream of reunification. He thought this is the, the, the his time in history where one can achieve something that nobody in Germany, almost nobody, believed in. Uh, not even he, I think, in his lifetime, that one can achieve a German reunification. And so he seized upon it and uh, he f followed it through. Kohl guided Germany through the upheaval with apparent success, though some contend the dream's going a bit sour. But wakening the sleeping giant wasn't met with unbounded enthusiasm in every corner of Europe. Mrs. Thatcher and Herr Kohl never really hit it off. His partiality to German unification and European integration wasn't exactly to her taste. I do remember a time uh, at the Koningswinter conference dinner. Uh, it was the year of German unification and the relationship between uh, Mrs. Thatcher and Kohl at that dinner were absolutely glacial. They didn't s address hardly a word to each other. And I think uh, Cole was rightly extremely angry that Margaret Thatcher didn't seem to understand the historic uh, uh, achievement of unification. So the partnership on which this scheme depends has to be France, the country Germany's invaded three times in the last century or so. Now the talk, and few doubt its sincerity, is of prosperity and a shared future. But there is another motivation too, a sense that unification by consent is the only safe way to save Germany from its own demons. Finding the right kind of political recipe is a cold speciality, but with parts of Germany and Europe in open revolt over the cost of European integration, even this political mixer par excellence faces a plate full of troubles. He's unlikely, however, to look like it's all getting to him. 
We're joined now by Rainer Gatterman, a journalist for Die Welt and former neighbour of Helmut Kohl, Sir Charles Pohl, Mrs Thatcher's former private secretary, and uh, from uh, Berlin by Petra Bleis, a PDS uh, MP at the Bundestag. Uh, Rainer Gatterman, do you think he's a great man? Of course he is, because uh, he has been uh, the leader of the CDU, of the governing party, since 73, has been uh, the chancellor since 82, and uh, he's, he's a strong power in Europe. I think uh, even the British have to recognize that. Well, that could be faute de mieux, couldn't it? I mean, do you think that by objective standards he is a great man? He is, at uh, least from the German point of view, mm. and I think from a European point of view as well. Petra Blais, why do you think he's so popular in Germany? Of course, I would say uh, he is really uh, like a symbol of German politics. But first of all, uh, I would ask uh, about the results of his politics during the last 14 years uh, in Germany. And uh, the first is uh, we have uh, to, to see the high rate of mass unemployment, the gap between rich and poor in Germany. This is the result of the Chancellor Kohl too. He is not only the so-called successful Chancellor of German Unification. He's a great deal more popular than your party is though, isn't he? Uh, I think uh, he is popular in Germany at all as a figure and I think ah. there are of course a lot of reasons for his uh, success because uh, of I think his kind, his language, uh, uh, he spoke uh, in a lot of pictures uh, but I think more important is what about his politics. I just come back uh, from uh, the parliamentary debate in uh, Bonn in the German parliament and we had a debate on the crisis of our budget but our chancellor was absent. He was for business in Indonesia and in the Philippines. And I think it's a typical symbol that our chancellor works outside of Germany so successful, but inside of the, our country we have the crisis. Right. Uh, Charles Pell, when you look at the big issue in Europe, the division mm. of Europe, the reunification of Germany, in the end, on that, he was right and Mrs Thatcher was wrong, wasn't she? Yes, I think that's a fair assessment. I think Chancellor Kohl showed himself a superb opportunist over reunification. Events moved far faster than he himself had ever expected, but he saw the opportunity and he took it. And frankly, full credit to him for that. But to be fair, it's not credit just to him. I think the credit lies particularly with President Gorbachev. After all, he created the conditions in Eastern Europe that made unification possible. And the credit lies a bit with the other Western powers, who after all were the solid allies of Germany.